Hello, I'm your host, Captain Paul Havis. The amazing aircraft I'm standing next to is over twice as fast as the 747 I normally fly. Join us as we meet the pilots and fly with them in the cockpit to London, England. Plus, you'll see the luxury of being a passenger, too, on how they fly the Concorde. John F. Kennedy International Airport, and even early on a summer morning, it's starting to come alive. Located in Queens, New York, it's the gateway to New York City and the United States itself. On 5,000 acres of land, it's half the size of the island of Manhattan, and directly responsible for the employment of 41,000 people. To the delight of New York taxis, over 30 million passengers came through JFK last year. And the airport expects 45 million yearly by the end of the century. The Concorde flyer tends to avoid most of that. At the British Airways terminal, with the flagship of the fleet being prepared for the flight, the Concorde passenger is recognized and afforded every convenience possible. From a separate curbside entrance, and at their own ticket counter, he or she is swiftly checked in for their journey. Even their bags receive priority handling, and the coveted Concorde baggage tag. With time to spare, the Concorde Lounge is a great way to unwind or catch up on some last-minute business. And like any fine club, drinks and hors d'oeuvres are served while the passengers are given the opportunity to look over the menu for the flight. Elsewhere, the cockpit and crew meet and begin by checking the computer-generated flight plan and weather summary. For any airline pilot, no two flights are ever the same. The weather and winds are scrutinized as to their effect on the fuel required, and the captain discusses it with the crew. So if you let them... Let them know that we need four tons. Okay, all the paperwork. So with the final fuel load agreed upon, the crew sets out for their aircraft. Entering the aircraft from the jetway, you quickly realize that the inside of Concorde is rather compact. Its designers had to make maximum use of all the available space on board. Captain Jock Lowe is a 21-year veteran of British Airways and is now the chief pilot of the entire company. With attention to the tiniest of details, he himself gives the cabin a last safety inspection prior to passenger boarding.
a cosmetic inspection too, to make sure that everything is befitting of a Concorde experience, as it's called. The cabin crew is also hard at work on their safety checks, making sure that everything's in its place. And that includes checking that the caterers have properly stocked the galley for the gourmet meal service. Up front, our flight engineer, Ian Smith, completes his initial check of the cockpit and then makes his way outside for a closer inspection of the exterior of Concorde. A 21-year veteran of British Airways, Ian looks for the little things that might have gone unnoticed by the mechanics. As pre-flight inspections go, Concorde is not that much different from a regular jet. The underside of any airliner is prone to dings and dents from ground handling equipment. So it's Ian's job to spot them and call the mechanics if need be. Although the structure of the landing gear is built to take a beating, it's a complicated piece of equipment. And both it and the tires get a good looking over for any sign of wear. Meanwhile, at the tail, the ground crew is busy loading the last of the baggage into the tail cargo compartment. While Ian finishes his pre-flight with a thorough inspection of the nose landing gear. Just upstairs, the passengers have already started to board. There's a first-class seat here for up to 100 of them, but our flight today will depart with 30 empty seats. Kennedy clearance, it's SP bad to Concorde 2. Heavy with Bravo for London, please. Tony Ewell has 17 years at British Airways and is senior enough to hold a captain position on a 757. It's his choice, yet he prefers to fly Concorde, even if only as a co-pilot. With our clearance received, it's time for the first checklist. All three crew members participate in this process, confirming that the items they accomplished in their individual panel setups have in fact been done correctly. The checklist is the foundation of every airline flight. The exact coordinates of this gate at JFK have already been loaded in the three inertial navigation units, as well as the coordinates of the various waypoints along the route of flight to London. The crew compares these INS displayed coordinates with those in the flight plan to assure precise navigation over water. Lastly, movable indicators on the airspeed instruments are preset to the takeoff speeds that the flight engineer has computed, based on the aircraft's total weight and outside air temperature. With the jetway pulled back, the before starting engine's checklist is reviewed. It's 1.45 p.m. in New York, we're right on time, and the pace begins to quicken appreciably. Down below, the lead ground crew member talks to the captain and gives the all clear to start engines. The Rolls-Royce Olympus engines are then started, one after the other. Unlike the large, wide turbofan engines we are used to seeing nowadays, these Olympus engines are pure turbojets and much more compact. 
During our start, they take a bit over a minute each before they've spun up and stabilized at idle power. With the last engine running, Captain Lowe orders the ground crew to disconnect the aircraft from the airport's electrical and air conditioning connections. Because Concorde carries no auxiliary power unit on board, to save weight and space, it's totally dependent on the airport to supply these services while its engines are off. The electrical access panel is securely locked shut and the remaining ground equipment is removed. With our clearance received to push off the gate, we are officially underway. It's hard to believe that this airplane is but one of only 13 Concords operating in the world today. Seven are in service with British Airways, and six are flying for Air France. And even experienced airline pilots, with tens of thousands of flying hours in all kinds of jets, have a hard time not staring when Concorde taxis by. and personnel safely away from us, the ground crew signals the cockpit visually. And Concorde begins a transformation. The nose and visor are lowered to a five degree nose down position to improve forward visibility for the taxi out, take off, and climb. Moving now under her own power, our crew begin a two mile long taxi that will eventually end up at the takeoff runway. And as can be expected, there are some checklists to accomplish at the same time. about seven minutes to arrive at the runway's end, with one remaining checklist to accomplish, the before takeoff checklist. With our takeoff clearance received, they pause for a brief moment and then do the standard Concorde countdown. thrust levers at this predetermined time to reduce the noise the engines generate on climb out. The afterburners cut out simultaneously and you can really feel this loss of thrust in your seat back. Still, the aircraft climbs out quite briskly, 
for Concord is now in her element, and it shows. The coastline of Long Island passes beneath as the crew both monitor their instruments and keep an eye out for ever-present air traffic. When a safe height is reached, above that of small aircraft, the nose and visor are retracted. Instantly, the cockpit noise is cut almost in half, and it feels, strange as it might sound, as if Concorde is actually starting to smile right about now. The departure routing from JFK is standardized for Concorde, and is in fact called the Concorde Climb by ATC. We'll climb at Mach 0.95 to 27,000 feet just along the southern coastline of Long Island. It isn't until we are past Nantucket Island, however, that we are allowed to accelerate through the sound barrier, Mach 1. The rules are that the sonic boom Concorde creates when flying faster than the speed of sound must not be heard by anyone living on land. Geographically, past Nantucket, there will be nothing but ocean until the southwest coast of England. As Nantucket fast approaches, the first of many bottles of champagne are being emptied. Ours may also be a first-time Concorde flight for some, so a pilot always takes this moment to explain exactly how and when they will exceed Mach 1 today on the public address system. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello, this is Tony Yu. And once we've crossed out and into the Atlantic, we are expecting air traffic control to give us permission to start the climb and accelerate. Uh, but when we do the acceleration, what we'll be doing is I'll be using full power, and, this, and I'll also be using the um, afterburners again. But this time I'll be bringing them on in pairs. Now as each pair comes into play, there is just a gentle nudge throughout the aeroplane. Now we'll maintain the status quo, that is, afterburners in full power, until we get to a speed on the screens in front of you, Mach 1.7. When they, uh, the afterburners that is, have been done their useful work in getting us through this area of high resistance, we'll be switching them off in pairs again. And there's just that sort of hint of a nudge uh, throughout the aeroplane. Now that's when this lovely lady really comes to her own, you know, because she's the only vessel of any kind ever built that can continue to climb to heights greater than 60,000 feet, achieving speeds greater than Mach 2 without the use of afterburner. We do in fact reach Mach 2 at 50,190 feet. Mach 2 today will be 23 miles a minute, and uh, one mile every two and a half seconds, or roughly 1,900 feet a second. Now the airplane is very temperature sensitive, and we tend to be drift up and down on our set track all the way across the Atlantic, but we do expect to reach a height between 56 and 58,000 feet uh, before we start the descent and deceleration on the other side. Just as we pass Nantucket, the clearance is received to climb and accelerate, and a short supersonic checklist is read. Ian Smith must now select switches to pump 6,000 gallons of fuel from the forward fuel tanks to a special tank located in the tail. Because Concorde changes its balance point by six feet when it flies supersonically, pumping this fuel into the aft tank will counteract this nose-down aerodynamic effect. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Tony Yule, we're just starting the uh, acceleration now. Here come the first pair of afterburners. There's a gentle nudge. Here's the second pair. And just shortly leaving 29,000 feet. That's it now. That's truly Mach 1. If it is your first time, welcome to the world of supersonic flight. Well, I'll leave you in peace now and uh, chat to you again just before we start the deceleration on the other side. Mach 1. It seems so easy on Concorde. Not even a ripple, and no hint that a little over 40 years ago, brave men died trying to get through it. One of those men, in a plane named Glamorous Glennis, became the first person to break the sound barrier. The year was 1947, the man was Chuck Yeager, and the airplane was the Bell X-1, a rocket-powered aircraft with straight but thin wings. A movie of that era, the sound barrier, actually portrays what test pilots were up against. 
Mach 1 was considered an almost impenetrable barrier back then, since airplanes had the nasty habit of exceeding it and then disintegrating. Many lost lives before designers and test pilots discovered that sometimes the flight controls became reversed past Mach 1 due to a bending of the airframe itself. The future Concorde would take its shape from this fighter design of the 1950s called the Ferry Delta II. Its radically shaped wing would prove to be just what Concorde needed to fly supersonically efficiently. If only those designers and test pilots back then could have seen us now, accelerating smoothly through Mach 1.2 with up to 100 passengers aboard. The afterburners are increasing our thrust now by 20%, but our fuel burners increased to the horrendous rate of 16,000 gallons per hour with their use. They work by pumping raw fuel into the tailpipe of the engine. Gratefully, they are only needed for takeoff in this short acceleration phase, because we'd never make it across the Atlantic if they had to stay on continuously. Ian now monitors the engine inlet ramp doors, which automatically start to close at Mach 1.3. It's essential that these doors block the inlets of the engines from the full force of the supersonic air entering them. By virtue of their design, they will slow the air to Mach 0.5, half the speed of sound, keeping the engines happy and running. On the front panel, the pilots also monitor the engines and the progress of our acceleration. Still climbing, we're through 40,000 feet. Passing Mach 1.7, the crew shuts down the afterburners, or reheats, as they call them. Acceleration up to our cruise speed of Mach 2 is made now using 100% engine power alone. And the engines will stay at 100% power until we're ready to descend. For our passengers, however, they have other things to think about, because it's time to eat. And on Concorde, it's a feast for the eyes, as well as the palate. Using the choicest and freshest of ingredients, the meals served aboard Concorde could easily compare to that of any five-star restaurant back on Earth. Settling in at Mach 2, Concorde actually has enough power to go even faster. The crew employ a cruise climb technique, however, converting this excess power into a very slow climb, arriving at an altitude of nearly 60,000 feet just before we descend. It all looks very intimidating, even for myself, a 747 captain. But if flying Concorde is technically demanding, Learning about it all can seem, from my perspective at least, to be rather intense. We followed a new Concorde captain through a few days of training, and here's what he had to say about it all. To fly Concorde, you have to be as familiar with the systems as you are with the different flying techniques. The classroom teaches the theory, but to know the aircraft, you really have to spend time studying its construction. And Tank 11, way back here underneath the fin, which is in fact uh, rear trim transfer tank. We had an interesting visit to the hangar with the ground engineers looking at various components of the aircraft. Seeing the wing, the undercarriage and engine components all helps to fit the whole thing in your mind. You learn the theory in the classroom, but it's nice to see the nuts and bolts as it were. 
But it's those nuts and bolts of Concorde that set it in a different league from all other airliners. The landing gear, as an example, may look conventional, but in fact they must automatically shorten themselves before they retract into Concorde. They wouldn't fit otherwise. Engine thrust reversers, seen here, also adjust their shape in supersonic flight to make the engine more efficient. And special metal alloys were required because of the heat caused by air friction at Mach 2. The wings themselves can heat to almost 220 degrees Fahrenheit, with the hottest temperatures being recorded at the very tip of Concorde's nose. A probe here displays that temperature on a cockpit gauge. The crew will even slow down, if necessary, to keep it below 260 degrees. Back on our journey, we've established ourselves on one of the three standard Concorde routes or tracks across the Atlantic, and we'll be making a position report soon. The North Atlantic air traffic is controlled by Gander and Shanwick Oceanic Control. Each day, five tracks are drawn up for the subsonic airliners to fly. They are 60 miles apart and are like one-way highways over the ocean. Concord operates above the height of these airliners, so three special SST tracks are used. They are labeled SQ, SN, and SM. We are now approaching longitude 30 degrees west, the halfway point on track SN, which in pilot talk is called Sierra November. We've been cruise climbing slowly for the entire flight and are now at 55,000 feet. At these altitudes, the curvature of the Earth starts to become noticeable as does the distinct darkening of the sky above. Approaching longitude 30 degrees west, navigation accuracy checks are performed, and the fuel on board is compared to what the flight plan says we should have. The time, wind speed, and direction, and the outside air temperature are noted. All this data is written down and relayed to Shanwick Oceanic Control on the position report. Copy. Speedbird Concorde 188. Sierra November 30 west at 1934, flight level 550 climbing, estimate Sierra November 20 west at 1954. Uh, the wind was 280 at 40 and uh, the temperature minus 52. From this exact point in my 747, I'd have almost three hours flying time remaining to London. Back in the cabin, dinner is now but a fond memory. We're getting closer by the second, and the crew is busy finishing up their splendid service with coffee and dessert. Once again, our first officer comes on to explain what is about to happen next. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hello, this is uh, Tony Yule. We're coming to that point where we'll start the deceleration and the descent. Now, initially, what we do is maintain our altitude here at 55,000 feet, still cruising at twice the speed of sound. And we bring back about uh, a third of the power. And when the speed gets down to about back 1.55 on the screen for front of you, we'll start our descent down to 37,000 feet. The, the route taking us up the Bristol Channel. And the rules of the game are we have to be subsonic, that is below the speed of sound, at a point 55 nautical miles before we get to the village of Two Martin on the North Devon coast, not very far away from Norfolk. As I said, we cruise in at 37,000 feet, just below the speed of sound, south of her birthplace of Bristol, along the line of the M4, over Reading, making an approach from the city, landing on runway 27 right. That is the main runway nearest the A4. The weather in London is fine, around 13 degrees centigrade. And the time was uh, 18 minutes past the hour of 8, and we expect to arrive there on schedule. Well, realistically, we have about 40 minutes to go. Thank you. The four thrust levers have remained fully forward at 100% power since we passed Nantucket Island long ago. We're 58,000 feet and still climbing. Preparing for the slowdown and descent, Ian again refers to a checklist for the event. Uh, fuel, CG. Speeding away from the sun, it's starting to get dark quickly. With engines pulled back now to 70% power, it will take 100 miles to slow to Mach 1. 
With the speed back to Mach 1.25, we've already started descending. Our descent will also make the sun appear to set even quicker. Right on schedule, we slow below the speed of sound. And somehow, to me at least, it's a rather sad moment. Learning to land Concorde appears more difficult than other airliners. Fortunately, there is a place to go and practice on other than the real thing. For senior British Airways pilots switching to Concorde, and for required semi-annual training, British Airways maintains a Concorde simulator at its training base. On the inside, there's no telling it from the real thing. Okay, I got 800 feet now. No. We got to ride along as this okay, brand new Concorde feet, captain got talked through a routine landing for the first time. This one would be relatively easy. Later, every emergency in the book would be thrown at him, and then some. Five hundred feet, and the power and speed are now stabilized. Now we're coming down to just a hundred to decision. And our decision height. Continuing. I keep it there nicely, and remember as we come into the last hundred feet, lock onto that attitude ten and three quarter degrees. Gets 100 feet, 50 feet, 40, 30, 20, 15. Very good. The simulator allows you to do all these things until you get them right. Stick well forward. That part of the course lasts for a minimum of 64 hours, which is quite a lot. Lined up on the runway. We take our feet off the brakes. Down the runway you come, keeping it into the center. Smooth rotation at 187 knots to initial attitude of 18 degrees. Reheats off at 500 feet, climbing until we reach 1,500 feet. And at the end of each week in the classroom, there's an examination. When the final exam has been passed, the simulator course completed, then you go to Prestwick for the baseline. That's when you actually handle the real aircraft for the first time. And at the same time, letting us slip down to 1,200 feet as we come onto finals and then reduce the speed to our landing speed of 162 knots, achieving a three degree glide slope all the way down to the ground. Any questions? No. Well, the aircraft's outside waiting for us. Let's go and fly. Right, Stuart, we have clearance for takeoff. Now's the time. Only once in your life you take the Concorde off for the first time. And we're climbing to 1,500 feet. See if you can contain it to that 1,500 feet, which is the second height. Right. So Most people like go to about two or four. Nice right. flutter. Okay, we're all cleared. Off we go. All set, everybody? Ready. Okay, three, two, one, now. Right, we're going to My first takeoff on Concorde was a remarkable experience. Because there's so much power, although you're accustomed to handling the aircraft in the simulator, you don't actually get the feeling of being shoved up the back as it goes off down the runway like a scalded cat. In fact, it's a source of great amusement for the training captains to watch the newcomers trying to cope with the aircraft's performance and level off at 1,500 feet. Of course, the passengers have no problem coping with Concorde's performance. 
After the meal, there's always time for a little Mach 2 nap or some interesting conversation. For us, we're near the end of our flight now, and every passenger receives a special Concorde gift as a memento of the journey. In the cockpit, it's fast becoming twilight, as Ian reads one of the last checklists for descent. Over England now, we are in an area of increased air traffic, and the visor and nose are lower to improve visibility. Things start to happen quickly now. We are treated like every other airliner by British Air Traffic Control and are issued a series of turns called vectors to fit into the flow of traffic for Heathrow. By this point, they've slowed us to an initial approach speed of 200 knots. Later, we will slow further to the planned touchdown speed of 160 knots. At about five miles out, the landing gear is lowered and the final checklist items completed. From here on, Concorde descends with its deck angle at 11 degrees nose up. Because of this, only the pilots have a good view of the approaching runway. Perfect landing by the first officer, and he quickly grabs and engages the reverse thrust levers. Reverse thrust is very effective at high speed, but by 40 knots, they've done their job and are stowed. With the gate open and waiting for us, we follow the green center line lights that are embedded in the taxiway itself. With less than 100 feet to go, the captain aligns Concorde with special lights mounted on the terminal building. When they indicate to stop, we'll be at the exact parking spot required of us.
And of course, to maintain that sleek look Concorde is famous for, the nose and visor are retracted for cosmetic reasons.